How would you pronounce this word? Goaty? Gotti? Well, you could argue that it's actually fish. F E SH. Fish. The argument doesn't really hold up, of course. GH only sounds like F if it comes at the end of the word, and TI only sounds like SH in certain instances. But it just goes to show how strange English spelling can be. If you've only heard a word and had to guess how to spell it, you'd be struggling, and vice versa. Why is this steak while this is streak? And what about done, gone, and tone? That's why we get things like this. E R Y G A I Q U E Pandalock. You are correct. <laughs> Studying for these Bs takes hours of repetition and a good understanding of the etymology. Hey, cool, uh, does this come from French? Oh, it's from a Latin-derived French word. By looking at the history of written and spoken English, we can begin to understand why the spelling can sometimes seem so illogical. Basically, writing systems are a secondary form of language. They reflect speech. And while spoken English has changed radically over the past millennium, English spelling was pretty much standardised by the mid-18th century. Which means the way that we spell today reflects the way English was spoken hundreds of years ago. Right from the beginning, the alphabet itself hasn't been very stable and we've never really had enough letters for all the sounds we make. About a thousand years ago, the Anglo-Saxons moved from a runic alphabet to a Latin alphabet, and even then there weren't enough letters for all the sounds. Over time, letters have come and gone, but we now have even more sounds in modern English, about 44 distinct sounds. The problem is, uh, as one linguist once described English as being like a gigantic linguistic vacuum cleaner, we kind of suck up words from so many languages, and that indeed has introduced a lot of inconsistency. English has a Germanic core, but also has French, Greek and Latin origins. And these all come with different spelling systems. Old English is the earliest form of English and was spoken for hundreds of years. It's very different from the English we speak today. That was gold, Cuny. After the Norman conquest of 1066, a lot of French words were introduced into the language, keeping their French spellings but adopting English pronunciations. Not only that, but the Norman scribes also made changes to existing words because they preferred French spelling. This was a big change for the language, but the biggest changes came during a period called the Great Vowel Shift. It was essentially a change in pronunciation, a general raising of all the long vowels, which happened over the course of a few hundred years. So when one vowel changes for whatever reason, shifts its position, pronounces is pronounced differently, this will trigger a kind of chain reaction change. For example, the Middle English poet Geoffrey Chaucer rhymed blood with wood. Both these words were pronounced the same at the time, blowed and woad. Later on in Shakespeare's time, the early modern English period, these words still rhymed but sounded more like blued and wooed. Over time, blood and wood have again shifted their pronunciations. But some words like food and boot still carry that oo sound. And early on during this pronunciation shift, spellings weren't set in stone yet. There were several different ways to spell a word because there wasn't any sort of standard or regulation. Basically, in early English you could kind of spell as you wanted. There was no right way to spell. And people would spell their names in different ways as well. But that all changed thanks to this thing. The printing press was introduced to England in 1476 by William Caxton, around the early stages of the Great Vowel Shift. And so books began being published using popular spellings that had already begun to be established. But that doesn't mean spelling was set in stone right away. Printers still took advantage of the flexibility of spelling to help justify lines on their pages. So, for example, they might add an E at the end of a word to make that line a little longer. And the fact that the E's had stopped being pronounced at the end of the word um, meant that, well, it didn't really matter whether it was there or not. So it did take a long time for for spelling to settle down. William Caxton and his Flemish typesetters also favoured Dutch spelling conventions and so they introduced the H in ghost. And other changes were happening as well. Consonants were disappearing in words like knife, knief, and knight, knicht. And words like detter and dute were being changed to match the etymology. These respellings sometimes resulted in mistakes or hypercorrections. For example, the B in dumb used to be pronounced and remained in the spelling as the sound disappeared. But then the B was added to words where it was never pronounced, like limb and crumb. Despite this, over time the printing press helped standardise English spelling. The problem is that by the time the Great Vowel Shift ended, 
Hundreds of books had already been published using a spelling system that reflected old pronunciation. If only printing had been developed at another time or the, these changes had happened earlier, then there would have been a better representation or better relationship between sound and letter. And after that, in the Renaissance period, new words kept entering the language, especially as a huge number of classical works were being translated into English, but with no equivalent English word in existence. Some words were borrowed as they were, and some were slightly altered. Along with the new words we still use today, there were also a lot of so-called inkhorn words that were introduced that didn't quite make the cut. But there was no real reason why some words remained while others didn't, which makes it all the more confusing. By the 1700s, an increasing number of scholars believed English needed more consistent spelling that matched pronunciation. Noah Webster, you might recognise his name, is often credited with being a major force in changing American spelling through his works. After the American Revolution, he believed strongly in developing cultural independence for the US. This included a distinctive American language with spelling changes he believed improved the spelling. He's mainly the one to thank for standardising spelling such as colour and traveller, and the change from aluminium to aluminum. These changes were accepted by the public, while other changes, such as tongue and women, were not. Something that isn't actually an Americanism, though, is the use of IZE. In fact, Oxford Dictionaries recommends IZE. One comes from Greek and the other from French. But now we seem to be disregarding etymology completely. So will any more spelling reforms take place in the near future? Now that English is spoken around the world, any type of reform would likely be both very hard and very expensive. But while historical influences enrich language, is enough enough? The ye in things like ye old shop shouldn't actually be pronounced ye at all. Originally, the was written with the letter thorn, which is now gone from the English alphabet. Over time, the writing of thorn looked more and more like the letter y, until it was really hard to tell the two apart. So ye in this context should actually still be pronounced the. Whether those shops are actually old though, well, you can be the judge of that.